Hi everybody, my name is Ian Hillman from storeandhost.com and I'd like to give you an overview of how I've learned about networking and go through some of the most important things. So let's start with the topics like, well, let's start off with the internet and it's a system architecture that has revolutionized uh, communication and the methods of commerce by allowing various computer networks around the world to interconnect. And sometimes it's referred to as a network of networks and the internet emerged in the United States in the 1970s and it didn't really become visible to the general public until the early 1990s. And by 2020, approximately 4.5 billion people uh, which is like more than half of the world's population were estimated to have access to the internet. And the, the internet provides a capability so powerful and general that it can be used for any purpose that depends on information and it's accessible by every individual who connects to one of its constituent networks. And it supports human communication via social media, electronic mail, email, chat rooms, news groups, audio, video transmission, and allows people to work collaboratively in many different locations. And it supports access to digital information by many applications, including the World Wide Web, the WWW, and it's proven to be a swarming ground for a larger growing round of e-businesses, including subsidiaries of traditional brick and mortar companies that actually carry out most of their sales over the internet. And that will be it for our introduction, and let's go further into networking. Well, let's look into the internet hierarchy. And if any system has access to the internet, it's connected to the global network and it's also connected to every other computer that has internet access. And so let's look at an example. Your personal computer is actually connected to a Wi-Fi. And so this Wi-Fi is then connected to the cable broadband modem. And uh, the modem uh, in turn is then connected to the regional network of the service provider, which is the ISP. And in the corporate area, your office computer might be connected to the peers in the local area network, which is the LAN. And this LAN is then connected to the regional network uh, of the ISP. And many ISPs are then connected to the zone networks, which further connects the networks across continents. And this actually then forms the global network. And so Internet is, in that case, network of networks. And it smartly connects to billions of computers and is able to access any requested web page in the time of milliseconds. And if you type in a website URL, for example, like google.com, the browser then searches for the server for google.com and then pulls the data from that website. And we will study in detail the core network elements and network protocols that build up this complex but powerful network of seamless flows of information right across the web. Let's look at the OSI model and the internet as a whole is a collection of different layers that are functionally stacked upon each other. And one such popular one, and it's now ancient, it's the OSI model. And OSI stands for Open Systems Interconnection Model. And it was developed in 1984 by the International Standards Organization, ISO or ISO, whichever way you want to say it. And it's a standard of various standards that work with each other in synchronization to provide a continuous data transmission. And the OSI system is divided into smaller parts that are called layers, and it is considered to be the first layer model of communication. So before the advent of such layered models, every function of the layers was actually written down in the application by the programmers. Whereas in a layered model, like the OSI model, each layer is assigned some specific tasks that define some key functions. And these assigned tasks are completed in their respective layers with the help of standards that are called protocols. And each layer has one or more protocols to complete one or more tasks. So let's look at the architecture. Each layer provides a set of functions to the layer above it and in turn it depends on a set of functions from the layer below it. So for example, on the receiver's end, data link layer gets the bits data from the physical layer, converts it into a data frame and passes it on to the network layer. Also, 
each layer communicates with its peer layer on another side, just like you can see donated on the diagram, by sending control messages back and forth. So for example, the transport layer of system A transmitter sends control messages to the transport layer of system B, which is the receiver. So let's look at the physical layer. We've got network cables. Transmits and receives bits through the network at the electrical level through a wire or medium. Yeah, and it defines protocol standards for sending and receiving data over the network devices. It also acts as an interface between network layer and physical devices like hubs and switches. The physical layer standards defines optical, electric, mechanical characteristics of signals like voltage levels, voltage fluctuations, physical data rates, transmission distances, and physical connections. Then we have cables. These are connectors and hubs that uh, reside over the physical layer. Then we have the data link layer, network switch, which takes a stream of bits from the physical layer and passes it on to the upper layers. It then converts the raw bits into data frames. And it also performs the work of error detection and correction. And after the error correction process, it transmits each frame separately to the next layer, which is known as the network layer. And devices like switches, these reside over the network layer. And then we have things like network router in the network layer, which converts the frames that it receives from the data link layer into packets. And this layer is responsible for assigning logical address IPs to the devices. So these IP addre addresses are coming from there. And network layers also translate logical network address to the physical address, like the device name to a MAC address. And it determines the routes for sending the data efficiently over the network. It also takes care of network problems such as data congestion and data loss. And network layer converts the data frames that are received by the data link layer into packets. And it also updates the higher layers with the details of how the data reaches its destination. So device like routers reside over the network layer. Then we have the transport layer. So we have things like the network firewall which converts the packets that it receives from the network layer into segments. And it also assures that the segments are now ready for transmission over the network. It provides error checking to guarantee error-free data delivery with no losses or any duplication of, network, of, of segments. And it also provides acknowledgement of successful transmissions. It requests retransmission if some packages don't arrive error-free or don't even arrive at all. Then we have the transport layer, which is equipped with features like flow control and error handling of data. Then devices like firewall reside over the network layer. Then there's the session layer. The session layer architecture is like this. It initiates, maintains, and ends sessions across the network. And for example, if you close the data network of your system, you actually end the session. And sessions can also be started and terminated automatically by the session layer. So responsible for identification of the devices so only the authorized people can participate in a session. It provides synchronization services by planning checkpoints in the data stream. So if the session fails, only data after the most recent checkpoint needs to be transmitted. And managers who transmit data at a certain time and for how long. Then there's the presentation layer and this is its architecture. And the most important function of the presentation layer is of formatting data. So different formats from all sources are made into a common uniform format that the rest of the OSI layers can understand. So responsible for protocol conversion and data encryption, decryption, this is mainly where it happens at the presentation layer. Then we have the application layer, like the computer application, which is used for applications that user sees and directly actually works on and allows access to network services that support uh, applications. And it also includes applications like web browsers, Firefox, Chrome, and those kind of browsers. And it directly represents the services that directly support user application like uh, file transfer and email. Yeah, and that's it for now. That's the basic stack of the OSI model. And now let's look at TCP IP model. Well, the TCP IP stands for Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol.
And just like OSI network model, TCP IP also is a network model. And the TCP IP model is functionally the same as the OSI model. Well, but this OSI is a seven layered standard and the TCP IP is a four layered standard. And the OSI model has been very influential in the growth and development of TCP IP standard. And that's why most of the OSI functionality is applied to TCP IP model. Well, the following figure actually shows the TCP IP structure. And let's look at the architecture. So there's the application layer. So computer application, you find that the application layer is the topmost layer of the four layer TCP IP model. The application layer is present above the transport layer and the application layer defines TCP IP application protocols and how hosts programs interface with transport layer services to use the network. An application layer includes all the higher level protocols like DNS, domain naming system, HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol, telnet, SSH, secure shell, FTP, file transfer protocol, TFTP, trivial file transfer protocol, SNMP, simple network management protocol, SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol, DHCP, dynamic host configuration protocol, X windows, RDP, remote desktop protocol, those kind of protocols. And then we have the transport layer. Well, the transport layer is the third layer of the four layered TCP IP model. And the position of the transport layer is between application layer and the internet layer. And the purpose of the transport layer is to permit devices on the source and the destination host to carry on the conversation. So transport layer defines the level of service and status of the connection used when transporting the data from one end to the other. And the main protocols that are included in the transport layer are TCP, Transmission Control Protocol and UDP, User Datagram Protocol. Then we look at the internet layer. And this is the second layer of the four layered TCP IP model. And the position of the internet layer is between network access layer and the transport layer. Internet layer pack data into data packets known as IP datagrams, which contain source and destination address, logical address or IP address information that is used to forward the datagrams between hosts and across networks. And so the internet layer is also responsible for routing the IP datagram. Its job is to allow hosts to insert packets into any network and to have them deliver independently to the destination. So at the destination side, data packets may appear in a different order than they were actually sent. And it is the job of the higher layers to rearrange them in order for appropriate delivery. And the main protocols included at internet layer are IP, Internet Protocol, ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol, ARP, Address Resolution Protocol, RARP, Reverse Address Resolution Protocol, IGMP, Internet Group Management Protocol. And then there's the Network Interface Layer with Network Switch. And the Network Interface Layer is the first layer of the four-layer TCP IP model. Network Access Layer defines details on how data is physically sent through the network, including how bits are electrically, or optically signaled by hardware devices that interface directly with the network medium, such as coaxial cables, optical fiber, or twisted pair copper wire. And the protocols included in network access layer are Ethernet, token ring, FDDI uh, by 0.25 frame relay, those type. And the most popular LAN architecture among those listed above are actually Ethernet. Ethernet uses an access method that is called CSMACD, Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Detection, to access the media when Ethernet operates in a shared media. An access method determines how a host will place data on the medium itself. And in CSMACD access method, each host has equal access to the medium and can place data on the wire when the wire is free from the network traffic. So when a host wants to place data on the wire, it will check the wire to find whether another host is already using the medium. And if there's traffic already in the medium, 
the host will wait and if there is no traffic, it will place the data in the medium. But if two systems place data on the medium at the same instance, they'll actually collide with each other and that will destroy the data. And if the data is destroyed during transmission, the data will need to be retransmitted. So after collision, each host will wait for a small interval of time and the data will then be retransmitted. So in this lesson, you've learned about the four layers of TCP IP model and the comparison between the four layered TCP model and the seven layered OSI model. So let's look at the application layer, the computer application. And this is used for applications that the user sees and directly works on. It allows access to the network services that support applications. And it includes applications like web browsers, like we mentioned, Firefox, Chrome, and those type of things. And it directly represents the services that directly support user applications like file transfer and email. Now let's look into the hypertransfer protocol, the HTTP, very important. And the hypertext transfer protocol is an application level protocol that provides a standard for web browsers and servers to communicate. Apart from its general use, it is also used for other tasks like name servers and distributed object management systems. HTTP clients such as web browsers and servers communicate via HTTP request and response messages. HTTP utilizes TCP port 80 by default, but other ports such as 8080 can also be used. A feature of HTTP is tying and arranging of data representation, allowing systems to be built efficiently. Yeah, let's look at file transfer protocol, FTP. And FTP allows you to transfer files between two computers that are on the internet. And FTP is a simple network protocol based on internet protocol. And it is also a term used when referring to the process of copying files when using FTP technology. And FTP uses the internet's TCP IP protocol to enable data transfer. So to transfer files with FTP, you use a program often called the client. And an FTP client program initiates a connection to a remote computer running FTP server software. So in any FTP interface, clients identify the FTP server either by its IP address, for example, 192.168.5.108, or by its host name, for example, ftp.mywebsite.com. So as a user, you can use FTP with a simple command line interface on your system or with a professional FTP client program that offers a graphical user interface. And that's about it for FTP. Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, DHCP. Let's look into that. So we got DHCP, and this is a network protocol that enables a server to automatically assign an IP address to a computer from a pool of addresses. So DHCP assigns an IP address when a system is started and DHCP allows a computer to join the network without having a pre-configured IP address. And internet service providers, the ISP usually use DHCP to help systems connect to the internet with mu minimum settings that are required. And some key settings required by DHCP are a pool of available IP addresses, the correct subnet masks, plus network gateway and name server addresses. And system running on DHCP clients can easily retrieve these settings from the DHCP server. And that's it on DHCP. Yeah, domain name server DNS. Let's look into that. DNS automatically converts the names that we type into our web browser address bar to the IP addresses of web servers where the website is actually hosted. And DNS stores the name in its corresponding address information for all public hosts on the internet. And domain names are alphabetic and hence they easier to remember. So because of DNS, we don't have to keep a track on IP addresses of all the websites. 
So for example, if you want to open the website google.com, you don't have to type its IP address. Instead, you just type in google.com on your browser and DNS will do the converting of the name into the actual IP address. So DNS assumes IP addresses do not change, are statically assigned rather than dynamically assigned. So the dynamic, which is the update of the previous DNS standard, updates the DNS server with the changes of the IP addresses on the, of the server, where the websites reside automatically. And that's about it on DNS for this lesson. Internet Mail Access Protocol for IMAP4. And IMAP4, Internet Mail Access Protocol V4, is an email protocol that forms an efficient way to access emails from the server. So with IMAP4, an email is stored on the mail server and can be accessed from any IMAP4 email client on the network. So when using IMAP4, many of the functions of the email client are performed by the mail server instead. And this includes things such as searching for messages, moving messages between folders, and that kind of stuff. And IMAP4 has some advantages in some situations. Because all email is stored on the mail server, it is easy to back up all email in one batch. Users can access the email from anywhere on the network. So if your users do not have a fixed computer to use, IMAP4 can be the solution. Users can share mailboxes. The IMAP4 protocol allows several people to actually log on to a mailbox at once to read messages. So access control lists allow you to restrict which users can do which tasks in a mailbox. So there are some disadvantages in using IMAP4. Because all mail has to be transferred over the network as it is read and it can be actually slower than reading mail from the local PC where it has already been downloaded to using POP3. And the load on the network is usually much more in that case. So mail is transferred every time that is read. So if a user reads a message in five different times, the message is transferred over the network five times rather than just once. So the load on the mail server is much more than what the POP3 protocol. And the mail server needs much more mail storage space. And that's about all that we'll cover on IMAP. Post office protocol. So let's cover POP3. So we got post office protocol version 3. And it's an email client on your computer that sends and receives mail via shared computer electronic post office. And it's the most recent version of a standard protocol for receiving email. So personal computers at homes usually do not prefer POP3. Pop and uh, it's mainly used in big offices where LAN coverage is much bigger. So POP3 mail client software on your system logs into the shared computer and transfers emails from your account to your computer. So POP3 is designed to delete mail on the server as soon as the user has downloaded it. So some of the features of, of POP3 include document attachment, automatic document encoding and decoding, user lookup, internal address books, font selection, signature files, and multiple mail management options. So POP3 and IMAP4 deal with the receiving of emails and not to be confused with the simple mail transfer protocol SMTP, which is a protocol for the transfer of email over the internet. Let's look at network news transfer protocol NNTP. And network news transfer protocol is the protocol used by computer clients and servers for managing the notes posts on Usenet newsgroups. And NNTP replaced the original Usenet protocol, UUCP, Unix to Unix copy. An NNTP client is included as part of a Netscape, Internet Explorer, Opera, or other web browsers, or you may use a separate client program that is called a newsreader. And NNTP servers manage the global network of collected Usenet newsgroup and include the server at the internet access provider. And when client 
is connected to the new server with transport layer security TCP port 563 is used and this is sometimes referred to as NNTPS and the NNTP protocol also allows for the introduction of intermediate or slave servers that accept news feeds from central master news servers and in turn provide services that is that are cached with news articles to local clients and NNTP applies a peer selection algorithm it modifies the local clock frequency to reduce its drift rate and that's about it for NNTP network time protocol NTP well network time protocol is widely used to synchronize the time for internet hosts, routers, and ancillary devices to coordinate universal time as disseminated by national standards laboratories. And it decides the core architecture, protocol, state machine, data structures, and algorithms. It also explains the fundamental on on-wire that is used to exchange time values between peers, servers, and clients. It summarizes the clock offset, round trip delay, and various other states used by the mitigation algorithm to calculate the maximum error and nominal error in computing these values. And that's mainly what we're going to cover on NTP. Real time protocol, RTP. Well, the real time, real -time protocol provides end to end network transport functions suitable for applications transmitting real-time data such as audio, video, or simulation data over multicast or unicast network services. And RTP itself does not guarantee real-time delivery of data, but it does provide mechanisms for sending and receiving applications to support streaming data. And RTP runs on top of the UDP protocol but the specification is general enough to support other transport protocols. And the control protocol allows monitoring of the data delivery in a manner scalable to large multicast networks and to provide minimal control and identification functionality. And that's mostly what we'll cover on RTP, real-time protocol. Session initiation protocol, SIP. Well, SIP is a signaling protocol that's used to create, manage, and terminate sessions in an IP-based network. And a session could be a simple two-way telephone call, or it could be a collaborative multimedia conference session. And this makes possible to implement services such as voice-enriched e-commerce, where, where, where you can dial and you got instant messaging, body lists and IP based environments and SIP has been the choice for services related to voice over IP VoIP in the recent past and SIP is a core protocol for establishing sessions in the internet. It transports session description information from initiator which is a caller to callee and allows to change parameters in mid-session and it's also helpful in terminating the session and that's mainly what we'll cover on SIP. Simple Mail Transfer Protocol SMTP well SMTP is independent of a particular transmission subsystem and requires only a reliable ordered data stream channel. So while we specifically discuss transport over TCP other transports are also possible and an important feat feature of SMTP is capability to transport mail across networks which is usually referred to as SMTP mail relaying and so using SMTP a process can be transferred to a mail on another process on the same network or to some other network via relay or gateway process accessible to both networks and SMTP is a protocol operating in online mode encapsulated in a TCP IP frame. It works using text commands sent to the SMTP server on default port 25 and you can manage the SMTP service from the Internet Information Service, the IIS Microsoft Management Console. 
an SMTP service sends and receives email between servers, whereas the POP3 service retrieves email from the mail server to the user's computer. Many mail servers support extended simple mail transfer protocol ESMTP, which allows multimedia files to be delivered as email. And there are phases of transfer. There's a handshaking greeting, a transfer of the messages, the closure, and so let's look at some advantages. It's the easiest and fastest way to get email from one place to another once you've transmitted your mail to the SMTP server. And since the real SMTP server is constantly connected to the internet, it can try resending its failures at any time. It's inexpensive, printable, global, convenience. Let's look at some disadvantages. While SMTP lacks the security specified in X 4.00, its simplicity limits its usefulness. And you get things like spam, forgery, interception, and misdirection. So those are the things we will cover on SMTP. Simple Network Management Protocol, SNMP. So SNMP is a tool, protocol, that allows for remote and local management of items that are on the network, including servers, networks, routers, switches, and other managed devices. And this protocol consists of agents and managers. So what's an agent? This is the process that is running on each managed node that's collecting information about the device that it's running on. And then the manager is the process running on a management workstation that requests information about devices on the network. SNMP protocol is the application layer protocol used by SNMP agents and managers to send and receive data. SNMP operates in the application layer of the internet protocol suite layer 7 of the OSI model. An SNMP manager is an SNMP agent that communicates using the SNMP protocol and generally managers sends the queries and the agent responds. So there's an exception when the traps are initiated by the agent. And a trap is a message that is asynchronously sent by a agent to a manager. So SNMP components, we have management information base, MIB. SNMP protocol provides information about devices and the variables information is provided by management information base MIB. And it's a collection of objects and their types in hierarchical tree format. So structure of management information, SMI, and SMI defines rules for naming objects, defining object types and showing how to encode objects and data. And what are the advantages? It's standardized, universally supported, extendable, portable, allows distributed management access, lightweight protocol, and some disadvantages. Information collected by the agents is distributed across the network to many nodes. And up-to-date information is not centrally maintained. Vendor-specific data cannot be published to the management community without providing an updated MIB file. And the MIB does not define behavioral characteristics of managed objects. The SNMP lacks cohesion with other management prototypes. It has some large security gaps that can give network intruders access to the information that is carried along the network. And that's about all that we will cover on SNMP. Secure Shell, SSH. So this is a program to log into another computer over a network, to execute commands in a remote machine, and to move files from one machine to another. So Secure Shell Client Service Solution provides command shell, file transfer, and data tunneling services for TCP IP applications. So that's the data tunneling also involved there. The connections provide highly secure authentication, encryption, and data integrity to combat password theft 
and it provides strong authentication and secure communication over insecure channels. It's also a replacement for our login, RSH, RCP, and RDIST. So SSH protects a network from attacks from things like IP spoofing, IP source routing, and things like DNS spoofing. So when using SSH's login instead of uh, the our login, the entire login session, including transmission and password, is actually encrypted, and therefore it's almost impossible for an outsider to collect passwords. And SSH is widely used by network administrators to control web in other kinds and servers remotely. And both ends of the client and server connection are authenticated using a digital certificate and the passwords are protected by being encrypted. And SSH uses RSA, public key, cryptography for both connection and authentication encryption algorithm including blowfish des and idea idea is the default action and the users of cryptographic algorithms too are authenticating both ends of the connection encryptal uh, transmission of all data and protecting data integrity validate values returned by the services such as dns or network protocols such as TCP. Security benefits, what would that be? The user authentication, the host authentication, the data encryption, and the data integrity, of course. And then some advantages would be it's strong encryption, and there exist free and commercial versions. It runs on many platforms. Tunneling of ports works very well and can be used for simple VPNs. And many authentication methods are also supported. So to most users, SSH appears to be the terminal emulator similar to Telnet. And the users don't see the encryption and therefore the security is transparent for the user. And some disadvantages would be when user is authenticated by the password, the client's RSA identity is not verified against SSH known hosts. And the licensee of, licensing of the original source has become very restrictive. SSH is not designed to be incorporated into network gateways such as routers or firewalls as a complete VPN solution. And TLS, SSL and IPSEC is almost transparent to use but SSH is not. And to use SSH, you have to be logged on to the user account to utilize the transport layer security. And it's not possible to tunnel UDP or ICMP traffic. And there are so many different implementations of the protocol that interoperability problems is starting to arise. Things like different implementations of the server may crash the client and vice versa. And this is happening despite that uh, SSH is being standardized by IETF. And that's what we'll cover on SSH. Telnet. So we got Telnet, which is an abbreviation for Terminal Network. And it's the standard TCP IP protocol for virtual terminal services as proposed by ISO. And Telnet is a protocol that provides a general bi-directional 8-bit byte oriented communication facility. And Telnet is a program that supports the Telnet protocol over TCP. And Telnet is a general purpose client server application program. And the Telnet program runs on the computer and connects your PC to a server on the network. The network terminal protocol Telnet allows a user to log in on any other computer that is on the network and we can start a remote session by specifying a computer to connect to and telnet is a common way to remotely control web servers and the client and server functionality comes built in in most of the operating systems however there are several third-party applications like party client or and these enable remote connectivity and Telnet has evolved into a new modern version of remote control that is uh, called SSH and we covered that and modern users will 
find telnet screens to be kind of slow and telnet is a character based communication protocol and you cannot use a GUI tool over a telnet connection and these interactive programs are not true uh, GUI programs because the cursor and the movement is controlled by the keyboard and not the mouse and so a telnet server generally listens on TCP port 23 and that's all we will cover on telnet transport layer security secure sockets TLS SSL well TLS transport layer security and SSL secure sockets layer are protocols that provide data encryption and authentication between applications and servers in scenarios where the data is being sent and across an unsecure network such as checking your email and the terms SSL and TLS are often used interchangeably and in conjunction with each other like TLS SSL but one is actually the pre decessor of uh, SSL 3.0 served as TLS 1.0 which as a result is sometimes re referred to as SSL 3.1 and there are two distinct ways that a program can initiate a secure uh, connection with the server so the first one would be by port and connecting to a specific port means that a secure connection will be used and for example on port 443 uh, for HTTPS secure web and uh, 993 for secure IMAP or 995 for secure POP and um, these ports are set up on the server ready to negotiate a secure negotiation first and to do whatever else you want second and the second thing by protocol so these connections first begin with an insecure hello to the server and only then switch to a secure communications after the handshake between the client and the server have actually been successful and if this handshake fails for any reason the connection is served and a good example is the command uh, start TTLS uh, used in outbound outbound email connections uh, on SMTP and the by port method is referred to SSL and the by protocol method is commonly referred to as TLS in many areas and the transport layer security TLS is a protocol that ensures that privacy between communicating applications and their users on the internet uh, when a server and client communicate TLS ensures that no third party may invade drop or tamper with any message so TLS is the successor to the secure sockets layer SSL and TLS is composed of two layers the TLS record protocol and the TLS handshake protocol and the TLS record protocol provides connections security with some encryption methods such as the data encryption st uh, standard DES, DES and the TLS record protocol can also be used without encryption and TLS and SSL are not interoperable so secure socket layer SSL protocol is responsible for keeping a lot of your online data secure from a functionality standpoint SSL and TLS are almost identical but TLS also encrypts data and requires a handshake to authorize servers before it spills its contents and the differences between SSL and TLS is subtle and extremely technical but TLS is generally a newer and more refined system and the safety of SSL's current version 3.0 is com compatible to uh, or comparable to TLS 1.0 and the SSL protocol provides connection security with the following points under consideration uh, privacy you'll find that it has connection through encryption and or identity authentication identification is done through certificates and the reliability dependable maintenance on a secure connection through message 
integrity checking and the transport layer uh, TLS uh, protocol was released in January 1999 to create a standard for private communications and the protocol allows client server applications to communicate in a way that is designed to prevent eavesdropping, tampering or message forgery and the goals of the TLS protocol are cryptographic security, uh, interoperability, extensibility and relative efficiency and uh, that's all we will cover on TLS SSL transport layer security secure sockets layer trivial file transfer protocol TFTP well trivial file transfer protocol is a file transfer protocol notable for its simplicity and it's generally used for automated transfer configuration or boot files between machines in a local environment and compared to FTP TFTP is extremely limited providing no authentication and is rarely used interactively by a user let's have a look at the presentation layer while the main function of the presentation layer is of formatting data it converts data from application format to network format and does that vice versa from all different formats are actually made into one common uniform format that the rest of the OSI can actually understand and it's responsible for protocol conversion character conversions data encryptions decryptions expanding graphics commands data compression and it sets standards for different systems to provide seamless communication for multiple protocol stacks and that's our presentation layer then we have the session layer this one initiates maintains and end sessions across the network and it's responsible for name recognition identification so only the authorized person can participate in the session and it provides synchronization services by planning checkpoints in the data stream and if the session fails only data after the most recent checkpoint will be transmitted and managers who can transmit data at a certain time and for how long so that's literally the session layer so we got the transport layer this converts the packets that it receives from the network layer into segments and it also assures that the segments are now ready for transmission over the network it provides error checking to guarantee error-free data delivery with no losses or duplications and it also provides acknowledgement of successful transmissions requests retransmission if some of the packets don't arrive error-free and it provides flow control and error handling and devices like firewalls reside over the transport layer over this network layer and then we have the firewall and a firewall is a hardware based network security system that controls the incoming and outgoing network traffic that is based on a rule set and the firewall establishes the barrier between the trusted internal network and another network for example the internet and that is not really assumed to be trusted or secure and firewalls typically protect internal networks from public networks and they also used to control access between specific network seg segments within a network and more sophisticated firewalls they block traffic from the outside to the inside but permit users on the inside to communicate a little bit more freely with the outside and firewalls are essential because they provide a single block point where security and auditing can be imposed and firewalls provide a important logging and auditing function and often they provide summaries to the administrator to what type of volume traffic has been processed through it and four general techniques of the firewall would be the first one would be service control here it determines the type of internet services that can be accessed inbound or outbound and then the second thing is direction control here it determines the direction in which particular service requests are allowed, to uh, are allowed to flow and the third one is the user control where it controls access to a service 
according to which user is actually trying to access it. And the fourth would be the behavior control. And this controls how a particular service is used. For example, a filtered email. And the different types of firewall, the first one is the hardware and software. So firewalls can be either hardware or software, but the ideal firewall configuration will consist of both. The second one is package filtering routers. And this applies a set of rules to each incoming IP package and, and then forwards or discards the package. And the filter packages are filtered going in both directions. And the packet filter is typically set up as a list of rules based on matches to fields in the IP or TCP header. And uh, two default policies, discard or forward. And um, then the third type is the access control list, the ACLs. And this is uh, the early firewalls implemented, uh, you know, typically on routers and they're useful for scalability and performance, but they can't read more than the packet headers, which provide only rudimentary information about the traffic. And then the fourth type is the proxy firewall. This intercepts all messages that are entering and leaving the network and the proxy server effectively hides the true network addresses. And then the fifth type is the application gateway. And this applies security mechanisms to, uh, to specific applications such as FTP and telnet servers. And this is very effective, but can impose performance degradation. And uh, another one is stateful inspection firewalls. And this is the next major revolutionary step that happened. And they classify and track the state of traffic by monitoring all connection and interactions and teleconnection until that particular connection is closed. And then uh, the seventh one will be circuit level gateways wait, apply security mechanisms where TCP or UDP connection is established. And once the connection has been made, the packets can flow between the hosts without further checking. The eighth one would be the next generation firewall NGFW. And the next generation firewall NGFW filters network and internet traffic based upon the applications or traffic types using specific ports. And the next generation firewall blend the features of the standard firewall with quality of service QoS functionalities in order to provide smarter and deeper inspection. And some advantages, a firewall blocks harmful packets, protocol filtering, information hiding, extended logging, centralized and simplified network management. And some disadvantages would be it's useless against attacks from the inside and it cannot protect against transfer of all virus infected programs and files. It can't do that. And that's all we will cover on firewalls. Transmission control protocol, TCP. So we have transmission control protocol, which is a connection oriented transport service, and it provides end to end reliability, resequencing and float control. And TCP is one of the main protocols in TCP IP networks. And TCP guarantees delivery of data and also guarantees that packets will be delivered in the same order in which they were sent. One-to-one -one and connection-oriented reliable protocol, which is used in the accurate transmission of large amount of data. So slower compared to UDP, datagram protocol, because of additional error checking that is being performed. And it's reliable, full duplex, connection oriented, stream de delivery, and it imposes significant overheads. So the TCP IP protocol, it was developed before the OSI model was actually published. And as a result, it does not use the OSI model as a reference. So unlike the OSI model, the TCP IP model has four layers and TCP uses selected repeat ARQ automatic repeat request. So that's all we'll cover on TCP. User Datagram Protocol, UDP. And 
They use the datagram protocol as a connectionless protocol and the UDP layer is responsible for communicating between two applications within two host computers and each application has a 16-bit port number that is assigned to it and UDP is located between the application layer and the IP layer and it serves as the intermediary between the application programs and the network operations and on the other hand the IP layer only provides communication between two host computers and they can be multiple applications that are running on each computer and UDP provides no reliability it sends the datagrams that the application writes to the IP layer but there is no guarantee that they actually reach their destination and UDP is more useful when a small message has to be sent and there's no requirement of its, re of its uh, um, reliability for example you know live video streaming and UDP will have minimal overhead so the UDP port numbers allow different applications to maintain their own channels for data similar to TCP and UDP port headers are two bytes long so therefore valid UDP port numbers range from 0 to 655535 and that's all we'll cover on UDP stream control transmission protocol SCTP this is a protocol for transmitting multiple streams of data at the same time between two endpoints that have actually established a connection in a network and this protocol makes it easier to establish a telephone connection over the internet and stream control transmission protocol is reliable message oriented transport protocol that provides new services and, and features for the IP communications they connection oriented protocols that provide reliable transport in sequence package delivery and rate adaptive congestion control and typically RTP runs on top of the UDP protocol although the specification is general enough to support other transport protocols and that's all we're going to cover on SCTP network layer well the two main functions of network layer is forwarding and routing let's look at forwarding it moves the datagrams from the incoming link of the router to the correct outgoing link and when it comes to routing routing is a task to identify the correct path from the sender to the receiver for example consider you taking a really long road trip and you'll be using a GPS to give you a path that will lead you to your destination and that's routing and so GPS provides you with the best path that is available and in your journey you come, aco you come across three toll stations and each toll station is a router which gives you the direction to the next toll station and hence that brings you closer to the destination you're actually going to and so the network layer also translates logical network addresses and names to the physical addresses like a device name to a MAC address and this layer is responsible for assigning addresses to the devices and as discussed earlier it helps determining the routes for sending the data efficiently over the network and it also takes care of network problems such as packet switching data congestion and routing and network layer converts the data frames received by the data link layer and um, it in converts it into packets and it also updates the higher layers into details on how the data will reach its destination and network layers sees to it that the packages reach its destination with minimum bandwidth requirements and minimum delay and high reliability and devices like routers reside over the network layer and that's all we will cover on network layer so let's look at routers a hardware device that is designed to take incoming packets analyze the packets move the packets to another network converting the pa packets to another network interface dropping the packets you know directing packets to another appropriate location and performing 
any other number of action. And technically, a router is a layer three gateway device and it means that it connects to more networks and the router is operating on the network layer of the OSI model. And the router's primary function is to connect networks together and keep certain kinds of broadcast traffic under control. And devices that connect to your router, that is the computers, tablet, the smartphones, DVRs, game systems, those kind of things. Those are called clients. And each client on the network is given an IP address which helps your router direct traffic to it. And clients within the network get a local IP address while your modem gets a global IP address. And global IP addresses are like street addresses while local IP addresses are like apartment, apartment numbers. So one lets you find the building that is in relation to the rest of the world while the other lets you find the specific location within the complex. So some of the features of the router the router limits the collision domain and routers can function on land and one and routers can also connect different medias and architectures it can determine best past routes for the data to reach the destination and can filter broadcasts and the types of routers we have browter so it's the short for a bridge router and a router is a network device that serves as a bridge and a router. And then there's a core router. And a core router is a router in a computer network that routes data within a network, but not between networks. And then we have a third type, an edge router, where an edge router is a router in a computer network that routes data between one or more networks. And then we have the fourth type, the virtual router. And this type is a backup router that is used within a VR virtual router redundancy protocol setup. So the VRRP. And then there's the wireless router. So we have the wireless router and we have the switch versus the router. Switches create networks, routers connect networks. And routers versus modems, a router is different than a modem. Your modem connects you to the internet while your router connects your computers to one another. So those are some of the distinctive things that show the difference between switches and modems and routers. Then of course you have wireless routers and that's all we're going to cover. Internet protocol, the IP. Well, the internet protocol is one of the most important network protocols that is used on the internet. And on the internet, you'll find that the internet protocol is used together with transport control protocol, which is then referred to as TCP IP. And IP is a unique way of addressing devices on a network. And this way, every device that is connected to the internet has a different IP address. But also note that a device with more than one interface can have more than one IP address. And most networks use the internet protocol version 4 IPv4 standard which is 4 bytes and 32 bits long and the newer internet protocol version IPv6 standard features addresses that are 16 bytes 128 bits in length and data on an internet protocol network is organized into packets and each IP packet includes header as well as the data messages and IP resides at layer three network layer of the OSI layer. And that's all we will cover on internet protocol IP. Internet protocol security, IPsec. While well, the internet protocol security uses cryptographic security services to safeguard communications over IP networks. And it is a framework for a set of protocols for security of the network or packet processing layers of network communication. And IPsec supports network layer, peer authentication, data origination authentication, data integrity, data confidentiality, and replay protection. And IPsec is said to be especially useful for implementing virtual private networks, VPNs, and for remote user access through dial-up 
connections to private networks. And a big advantage of IPSEC is that its security arrangements can actually be handled without requiring any changes to the individual computers, the user's computers. And the TCP IP applications use SSL. So IPSEC is an excellent solution to securing the traffic of legacy applications. IPSEC provides two choices of security service. Authentication header, R, which essentially allows authentication of the sender of data, and encapsulating security payload, ESP, which supports both authentication of the sender and encryption of data as well. And that's all we will cover on Internet Protocol Security, IPSEC. Address Resolution Protocol, ARP. Well, ARP is a network layer protocol for obtaining the physical address, MAC address of a device when the IP address, logical address is actually known. So when a device wants to send data to another device over the network, it must first determine the MAC address of that device. An address translation with ARP has two phases. The first one being ARP request. And there, a computer which is a part of the network broadcasts an ARP request to all the computers on the network to fetch the physical address, which is the MAC address of the required computer. And this ARP request contains the IP address, logical address, of the destination computer. And the second way, the second phase is ARP response. And the computer whose IP address is the same as requested responds with an ARP reply which contains its own MAC address. And it is most commonly seen on Ethernet networks. And that's all we'll cover on Address Resolution Protocol ARP.